It's early morning in the remote, high-desert country of Utah's Canyonlands. Two climbers, Don Welsh and Jim Zellers, wake up and prepare to climb the Primrose Dihedrals on Moses, a freestanding 600-foot sandstone tower. People climb for many reasons, and although no one may ever distill the prime motive, each climber has at least an intuitive sense of what bonds him or her to the sport. Fifty years ago, the Primrose would have been an impossible route to free climb because 50 years ago, nylon ropes, advanced protection equipment, and dynamic belays didn't exist when pioneers of the sport, like Dick Leonard and David Brower, were pushing the limits. One element does remain the same today as it did then, the discovery of the unknown and the adventure of the ascents. Let's go back to the 1930s with Dick Leonard as he explains the development of many of the skills and equipment which are used today. Well, I needed some exercise, and the, uh, the parks in Berkeley are huge volcanic rocks from 500,000 to 140 million years in age, and uh, some nice cliffs, and I read all the mountaineering literature in the uh, Sierra Club library, which has a very complete uh, library, and uh, so I... Uh, was reading that and found that uh, they insisted that you could not hold the fall of a person falling from above the climber. And therefore, if a climber, the leader, fell, he knew that and he had therefore violated his duty to the others, two on the rope, because he would kill them when all three of them went off, as they did on the Matterhorn. And uh, he should just put the rope over a rock and uh, sacrifice the leader. I thought that was a heck of a way to be a part of a climbing team. So I started studying how to do it. We started with a cotton clothesline, which later turned out had a strength of about 200 pounds. And uh, so it didn't have the elasticity that uh, you have with the present uh, nylon, which, by the way, I later developed in World War II uh, for the mountain troops. We learned from our belaying that for a dynamic belay to make it as harmless as possible, the rope should run just as far as the person fell. So if you fell 15 feet and you let the rope run 15 feet around your body, the highest force required would be only twice his weight. And uh, the climber below would rise up and put his weight on it with the rope around the hip of the belayer up above, who, by the way, always was anchored back to the trees or the rocks behind him so that he wouldn't be pulled off. Uh, because one of the major rules of uh, belaying is that you should never be pulled off of the belay. If you have to drop the climber even 20 or 30 feet, it's just like rappelling or roping down uh, that much distance with the friction of the rope around the body, it won't hurt the person. So we did that first six inches, then 12, then two feet. Finally, I was jumping off a overhanging cliff at Indian Rock, a lava outcrop at the lower end of the Berkeley Hills, 35 feet above the ground overhang, and I would drop 18 feet with uh, slack before my belayer would start holding the shock around his body and letting the rope run. Well, I think very few contemporary climbers do anything like that, and perhaps it's a, perhaps it's a shame, but we take for granted that the equipment these days is, uh, is very good and, and so forth. Next, renowned environmentalist and climber David Brower relates the experience of taking part on the first ascent of Ship Rock in New Mexico in 1939. This climb was one of the greatest climbing achievements of that day and is still considered one of the 50 classic climbs of North America. On Shiprock, which was the other major, let's say, continental climbing objective of that day, the Sierra Club group was successful. Who in your group uh, had the idea to turn to that objective? I think Dick Leonard is probably the one who picked it out, but I'm not sure that uh, who would take credit. But we were all quite interested in it because of the attempts that had been made and particularly the failure the latest one of the, the Colorado group, and the article in the Saturday Evening Post, a piece of bent iron, and we thought we'd see if we could do something without bending the iron. 
So did, what kind of research did you uh, carry out before you went there? Any special equipment you carried with you? Well, we read everything we could read about it. We looked at all the photographs and tried to figure out what we could do. And then the, the special equipment we took, and this is the first, as far as I know, is the expansion bolt, so we could have good solid anchors and what was not good solid rock. So these weren't designed for climbing. Where they, you know, what were they used for? Really? They were designed for hanging signs off of walls and buildings. And uh, we thought if we could hang a sign from one, you could anchor a belay from one. Now, in this next section, uh, Who's, who's going to be leading here? It's obviously very steep. I guess we're now in the double overhang. Yes, we're point. on the first of the 12-foot the overhang. There's another one that's 18 feet above that. And this is the 12-foot overhang. And, and uh, that's where Bester Robinson is, will be in the lead, pounding betons and exhausting himself, coming back to rest a couple of times. He was but standing he on Rafi Badean, who was the, the next heaviest person in the party. He took abuse very nicely. This is the, the walk into the bowl. A little bit of exposure, but uh, enough hold so that all you had to do was care, care, reasonably careful balance climbing. Now, the team made a bivouac that night, as, as you mentioned um, before. You only made 12 feet one yes. day. You, you decided you had to stay on the mountain to get the job done. Right. Bivouacking was quite unusual in those days. Well, it was unusual, but it wasn't the sort of thing that they've done later where they hang from pitons all night. We had a nice, comfortable place to sleep, just a little gravel and lots of room and uh, a little chilly. but. I slept on the outside to keep the others warm. Now, um, in this scene, um, who is this? And, and what's, Johnny what's he Dyer doing with the has, rope? Has yeah. proceeded above a place where Vester put a lot of direct aid pitons, and then Johnny went out because he was a light man. If there was to be a fall, threw a rope over what we called the horn, which Raffy fixed on the other side, and Johnny went up the rope and placed the fourth bolt at the top of that, okay. so that he could belay me on my my next attempt. Okay, so now, um, in fact, I believe we see you leading in this next picture. Yes, and what, what's the foot gear you're using well, here? Well, we're using tennis shoes with crepe soles. We figured that crepe soles, crepe rubber was the best. So that's what we did. So Basketball shoes, really. So no special, uh, specialized equipment really couldn't be obtained no. in those days? Though. No, all, all we could do was take tight-fitting shoes. We thought that we could feel the holes better that way, but there was none of what you have now. And uh, I think the crepe would roll readily off with their climbing these days. I think it days. wouldn't be considered too good today, <laughs> crepe. <laughs> So the, the ropes you obtain in the United States, uh, or from Europe maybe? Uh, those were manila ropes, and uh, wherever they grew manila hemp, that's where they came from. Nylon had not been invented yet. Dick Leonard had to do that later. Right. I was up there first, and then uh, Johnny Dyer and Rafi Badean and Bester at the camera. And it, uh, that was our climax. Well, this was a very considerable achievement for the Sierra Club group. It's uh, considered one of the classic climbs of North America. Uh, what, was you, what was your feeling of what you'd done? Well, we were rather happy about it, and uh, particularly happy when uh, Robert Underhill, Bob Underhill from the Appalachian Mountain Club, said he thought it was the finest climb that had been done on the continent. Quite a bit was done after that that made this fall into the shadows. That's always the way it is. Uh, someone <laughs> pushes it is. forward, and then yes. the next group, and, and so on and so forth. The standard of difficulty was raised, along with the development of safer equipment and better techniques. In 1974, several unsuccessful climbing attempts were waged on the gently overhanging east face of Washington's Column. The 1,600-foot wall lies across from Half Dome on the north side of Tenaya Canyon in Yosemite. Those early attempts inspired the imagination of three young Yosemite climbers. Early one spring, Ron Kalk, John Backer, and John Long set off amid a pessimistic reports from fellow climbers on the feasibility of free climbing the face. They encountered the adventure of a lifetime. Exhausted, they summited early that evening, managing to free climb the entire wall. The route was renamed Astro Man in light of their free ascent. Nothing in the world at the time could compare to the sustained nature and difficulty of the line. With five pitches of 511 and five more of 510, demanding every skill from thin cracks to off width and face climbing, Astroman is one of the finest, hard, long free routes in the world. Climbers travel from points across the globe to test their abilities on this renowned climb. The sole of the route is comprised of four separate crux sections. The first crux is the boulder pitch. Although it is short, the moves are thin and tenuous. You must cling and grope for fingertip locks and crimps in a blown out seam. The worst part is, the wall leans at an odd, off-balanced angle, making it very difficult to get your weight over your feet.
Immediately after this is the fantastic enduro pitch, 135 arm blasting feet of hand and finger jamming. This is the most pumping and sustained section of 511 on the route. The third crux is the infamous Harding slot. Both feared and revered, the slot has a double overhanging size dependent off width squeeze chimney 900 feet above the ground. Finally, you must delicately negotiate the changing corners crux, which climbs out from a dihedral crack over an arete to a steep face. The tricky part is relying on your partner's eyes to solidly secure a blind protection placement. From here, it's only a few more pitches of 510 to the summit. This morning, two of Yosemite's top climbers, Mary Braun and Deanne Gray, set off to climb Astro Man. I don't know what my problem is. The general lameness. In order for Mary to climb the enduro pitch efficiently, she must maintain a delicate balance between secure protection placements while moving quickly enough so she does not get too pumped and lose her grip. Good resting spot here. I know, do that. <laughs> yeah, you can hang out. <laughs> Hope the birds don't mind me coming here. Or was it cold? No, I totally forgot about the new weather. Because it's cranking so desperately. Well, but you made it. I know I had to rest, though. And there's two obvious places. The uh, stem? Uh-huh. And then a, another stem on little tiny edges up higher. Oh, body. That crazy <sighs> over here there. Here. So which way does it go? Okay, when you get up to the top of that flake, you you do a lie back. Uh huh. You go left, and from when you turn the lie back, you can see the ball of the anchors. Okay, I can't get any gear in in this off part, though, huh? Uh, you can, but just to make sure that when you put a piece, when you put, put your pieces in, you put long there. runners on it. I'll be out of there. This is desperate. Watch me. Okay, watch out for the loose rocks. Know, hey, Deanne. Yeah. I'm going to give you an extra friend just in case. Are you safe where you are? Uh -huh. Okay. Oh, I see there's a crack in the back of that back there. Oh, I see. I'm going to take you off the leg. Go ahead, pull the line up. Okay. Okay. 
Okay, go back on belay. Yeah, it's beautiful rock anyway. Super beautiful. Yeah, clean. That looks really nice. Now I see what you mean about being right facing. Uh huh. Facing this way. Mm -hmm. We have a stack of chalk in the bars in front of you. The Harding slot is an intimidating feature. A strenuous roof crack leads to the slot itself. Mary will try to wedge herself into the squeeze chimney before her feet cut away from the wall. Okay, I'm gonna look at it for a second. If I can find a better slot. Good one or what? It was a little bit good. It's hardly <laughs> like you were falling. <laughs> you did. Oh, well, that was pretty good. How's that gear? I think pretty good. I mean, it held the ball. Okay, I'm gonna go back up and try it again. Hey, Mary, get in there. Yeah, watch me here. <laughs> about being inverted in a crack. When I get out, when I, when I do the switching corner, mm -hmm. I'm not going to be able to look around the corner because I'll be out on the face. Uh -huh. Above the changing corners move, the climbing eases to 510.
Mary is a strong crack climber. She appears completely at ease on this section, 70 feet out from her last piece of protection. Astroman is a spectacular climb. As Dan finishes the last pitch, the cool evening air begins to descend into Yosemite Valley. It's been a most adventurous day. The latest development in free climbing took place several years ago, occurring with a big bang. The dust is still settling today. Sport climbing was the result. Like the boulderer, as Ron Kalk demonstrates on the famed Midnight Lightning Boulder Pump, the focus is oriented toward purely gymnastic movement. As such, standards of difficulty have increased greatly beyond what was once considered possible. aspect of, of sport climbing is, is probably the most important aspect of sport climbing. You work a route, you know you can do the moves, and yet something keeps you, keeps you from doing them. And it's, it's that mental control, that focus, that if you, if you can't control that and, and really direct it and be focused towards something, then you won't be able to do it. When I'm on the verge, and I, I know it's either going to be next try or two tries away, uh, I become very relaxed and something clicks and uh, I'm not anxious about it anymore. It's more of a confidence. It's just like, I know I'm going to do this route now. A steep climb named Desire is considered to be one of the most difficult sport climbs in California. It lies on star walls at Donner Summit near Lake Tahoe. The wall overhangs so severely that the top of the route extends 35 feet beyond its base. The climber route of this grade takes a tremendous amount of motivation and hard work. Don spent months working the moves before he was able to successfully climb the 80-foot pitch. As any top climber will tell you, it's about believing in yourself staying motivated, and moving past failure, even when it feels impossible. The route is 13A to this point. Don must now gather his remaining strength and focus on the crux section ahead. He needs to fire for a series of small underclings and side pulls, and then shoot for a five-foot lunge.
From here, he just needs to stay focused and stay strong to make it. The remainder of the moves out the roof and face above are 512, and Don knows them well. On the California coast, north of San Francisco, are a couple of seaside crags known as Mickey's Beach. The southernmost formation jets out above the ocean. On its underside is a 50-foot overhang called the Endless Bummer. Scott's a boulderer at heart. He put the route up several years ago. Seeing this dramatic and beautiful line is the ultimate boulder problem. But with so many difficult sequences in a row, no rests, his boulder problem became a route. I went out and looked at it and was just awestruck by it. I'd never seen anything like it. It's, it's uh, like a 30-foot roof, and then the crux is turning the lip on really heinous slopers. Ron has come to the Emeralds in Northern California to try a route named Aqua. 
It's a deceptively steep line in an old river gorge where misty waterfalls pour from the rim, splashing down on giant boulders that were once the river's bottom before it was dammed in the mid-1950s. Crux moves begin just off the ground. Ron throws a long dead point to a small sloping hold. He needs to secure a heel hook in order to keep his body close to the wall so he can let go with his right hand and grab a more secure hold above. Aqua requires a rare blend of explosive power and delicate movement. Ron must now finesse his way up a smooth, slabby section on dime-sized edges. These moves finish with a lunge to a good hold, but once again, the angle moves beyond vertical. The endurance crux of the climb comes near the top. Not as technically difficult as the prior crux section, it feels harder, coming after nearly 80 feet of overhanging power climbing.
Dale Goddard, take one. The mental aspect comes first. It, it underlies everything else because that determines, you know, how you even go about physical training or what you what you spend your time on. You got the largest bug crawling across your shoulder. Yeah. <laughs> God, bug world. It's still there. Where? It's on your right shoulder. Oh my God. Dale Goddard, take two. So much of climbing is just like dealing with failure and learning how to pick yourself up after failure. I mean, anyone, any climber can, can try hard and keep at it when it's fun, when, when they're climbing well, when it's nice out, when it's really enjoyable. And that's not really what makes the difference between, you know, someone who's going to end up being a really excellent climber and someone who's going to kind of plateau at some level. You know, the difference is, with, is how you respond when it's hard, when you do poorly, when, when maybe you climb badly for an entire season. You know, that can be really depressing, but you know, perseverance through something like that can can take you to new highs. You really have to like yourself to do well, I think, partly just because that's what determines what you expect of yourself. You know, if you have a, a, a bad self-image, that comes down and affects um, you know even the smallest thoughts in your mind when you're looking at an individual dyno. You know, that affects whether you can actually see yourself latching the hold. You know, whether you think, well, yeah, I am basically a good guy. I'm a good climber and you know, I'll probably hold on to this because I'm great. You know, if you can think that honestly, then it really helps you get up things that you wouldn't otherwise get up. I think the mental aspects underlie everything else. They come first because they determine how you go about training, what you focus on, and they determine how you deal with failure. How, you know, whether, when you can, whether you can pick yourself up after a bad day, how long it takes you to get psyched again. So yeah, that has to come first in terms of priorities. I think. You know, you've got to be honest with yourself in, in terms of assessing, you know, what are my real priorities in climbing? Why, why did I really fall off that route? You know, was it that I was too weak or was, I, you know, was it something else? When people look at what makes them fall off routes, it's really deceptively easy to think, well, I'm just too weak. I mean, almost anything can bring you to that conclusion. Um, let's say you're, you're really uptight. I mean, this happens to everyone too. You know, there are days when, you got, when you're just, you don't really feel like falling because it's kind of a scary thing sometimes. And so, if you're really concerned about that, you can be holding on to every hold with twice the amount of force in your fingers that you really need. And, and then you fall off and you say, yeah, I was too tired, I'm too weak, I don't have the endurance, I don't have the power, when that's not really what made you fall off. I mean, that's what it ends up feeling like, but uh, you're getting tricked into thinking that strength is everything, and a lot of people do that. Goals are critical, and uh, not just, I mean, they are what motivate what you do at the crag when you go climbing. Uh, I think more important though than just having goals is having the right kind of goals because a lot of people they set these goals that are so far in the future, so far beyond where they are now that they have no measure of, of, of uh, judging how they do on a given day at the cliff and so you know they, they might do really well for them but it's like oh yeah well that still sucks compared to what I should be doing or you know I'm still so far away from my goal. You know it's, it's you've got to take it incrementally and you've got to realize that things go slowly, that there are always setbacks, that you plateau for a while, that you have good weeks, you have bad weeks. And, you know, I can hear people saying, well, aren't some people more talented than others? So that, that's not really true, but... Yeah, it's true, but talent is, is an opportunity to do well, but it's... it's not going to get you anywhere in itself. And I mean, I, I think, in fact, it can be a disability for some people, because a lot of people who are really talented they're so used to getting, you know, really good results just on their talent that they're not used to, uh, or they're not comfortable when it comes to putting in the really hard work that's necessary to turn talent into something that's really satisfying. Having a satisfying life is about doing things that are rewarding. And I mean, you really quickly notice that doing hard climbs isn't really very fun, but it's really rewarding. And I, I think that's because um, in climbing, you know, what you get out of it is directly proportional to the quality and the, the quantity of effort that you put into it. To reap rewards, you have to put something into it. To have fun, you don't really have to put anything into it. All you do is sit back and enjoy, you know, like going to a movie. I mean, it's fun, and it, it's a necessary part of living, but it's not really what, what makes you go, wow, I'm leading a rich life, you know.
The routes at Cave Rock, Nevada wind their way out the mouth of a giant cave situated above the cool blue waters of Lake Tahoe. This place is wild. The average steepness of the rock, 135 degrees. Bill is wearing a special video camera unit called a finger cam on his head. It's about the size of a mushroom. It reveals, for the first time, the climber's point of view. So sit back, fasten your seat belts, and enjoy the ride. I've seen a lot of climbers attempt panic in Detroit, an extreme thin crack climb at Donner Summit, but I've never seen anyone as smooth or relaxed as Bird. Although Panic is a crack climb, most of the jams are so thin that Bird crimps the edges of the crack using face climbing techniques as opposed to straight jamming.
nature of this kind of climb, being a crack, lends itself to the placement of clean protection as opposed to being protected by bolts. There is an added element of difficulty and an increased level of self-reliance necessary to dangle by one arm and place protection, as each piece is only as good as the climber's ability to place it. A hard thing to do while clinging to 512 moves. One of the most amazing rock formations is the Monkey's Face at Smith Rock, Oregon. On the monkey's tallest and most intimidating side is an overhanging double arete called the Backbone. The pitch begins 80 feet off the deck and climbs for 140 sustained feet. The moves are terribly exposed, and watching Hans climb, you really get the sense that he's hanging on the hairy edge of nothing. Hans works both the rats from side to side, squeezing in opposition while searching for small edges and pockets that dot the face.
The backbone is truly a spectacular climb in a spectacular setting. In Berkeley, California, a recent trend in sport climbing was taking place. Most of the top competition talent in America had assembled at City Rock Gym for the U.S. National Sport Climbing Championships. Indoor climbing is perhaps one of the fastest growing segments of climbing. Routes of varying difficulty can be created by simply arranging a series of artificial holds which simulate natural features. A course setter can design a climb that mimics any natural combination of moves imaginable. And with the ability to control the environmental factors such as night and day, temperature and weather, you have what some climbers have dubbed the best crag in America. What you gonna play now? I think that a real key benefit of indoor climbing is its accessibility. I mean, someone can get off work, drive over here in five minutes, and in two hours experience climbing. I mean, they can take a lesson, they can learn, they can learn to move, they can get to the top of a wall, lower off, catch somebody falling, fall themselves, and, and really enjoy and experience the whole, the whole sport in the indoor context. Well, competition climbing really started in the late 70s with the Russians and the Eastern European countries doing competitive speed climbing. Russia. And yeah, and outside of the uh, Eastern Bloc countries, there wasn't a hell of a lot of interest. And it pretty quickly died out. But in 1985, in uh, I think it was Bardonecchia, Italy, the Italians cranked up and did their first real difficulty competition. This was the outdoor competition. They had rain delays and environmental damage, and they had to chip holes in the rock. And what happens when a hole breaks? You know, you, you, Exactly. Uh, so it very quickly moved indoors, but there the first few major competitions were outdoors. And these things attracted 10,000 paying spectators. And some smart promoters said, you know, there's a future in this. And there is a future in it because it's, uh, it's exciting to watch, it's fun to do, and uh, it's, uh, it's, a new, it's a new sport. It really is a new sport. Competitive sport climbing combines all the power, grace, and excitement and competitiveness of any top-level professional sport. The athletes are some of the finest in the country. Their drive and abilities are reflected in the high level of training and commitment that each is dedicated to the sport. This is an on-site event meaning each competitor tries to reach the top of the wall on their first try without prior knowledge of the moves. All the climbers are kept in isolation until they attempt the route. A fall determines each competitor's high point and best placement in the event. Ideally, only one competitor should reach the top, while the rest fall off somewhere down below. After two days of heavy competition activity, the field had narrowed to 10 women and 15 men who would compete in the finals on Sunday. Nearly half the field had attempted the wall and no one had made it to the midway point. An air of frustration settled over the competitors that had climbed and the audience. Oh, oh. Are you good at that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm better just have someone for the big drink. No one in isolation was aware of the events taking place outside. Hey, hey. My thighs have gotten smaller well, since yesterday. You, you will get some slips right now. Okay. Thank you, though. Huh? All that purging last night. Bathroom monitor. We need the bathroom monitor. God, there's a good audience out there, huh?
Setting up this course, uh, a very extreme sequence of movements that uh, continually get harder and harder, but and never at any one particular Relax. point are too hard. How did you get into setting courses? Uh, well, I was a member of the U.S. team two years ago, and uh, Jeff Lowe at one point invited me to course set for the U.S. National Championships in Snowbird, and uh, I met and course set in conjunction with the two top French course setters, Antoine Mestral and Fabrice Griot. And uh, at that time, they shared a lot of their insights with me and, and told me that I was the only other course that they knew that really was trying to do the same thing, namely really make climbing a dance, you know, a dance of difficulty, a dance of uh, tenacity. With so many climbers out here today, how do you make the course fair for everyone? Uh, a lot of that has to do with experience as well, knowing the kind of distances that are involved. A lot of times I extend my arm past a hold to a certain point or I make sure that my stem that I've got set up at that point is, is something that I could extend another six or seven inches or something like that. And, and making sure that intermixed inner root are moves that will complement both a shorter person's style and a taller person's style. Finally, the top three spots in the women's event were decided. Diane Russell placed third, falling off near the top. Allison Osius and Bobby Benzman both made it to the top of the wall and would square off in the superfinals event. Jason Karn was the first man to make it to the top of the wall. Check it out. Hans Florian would also make it to the top. Dale made the final lunge, he was pulled off the wall by his Blair. The judges decided to give Dale a technical, allowing him another chance at the wall. He succeeded and would enter into the Super Finals event with both Hans and Jason.
The super finalists will now go back into isolation while the course setters put up the super finals route. Oh, Allison slips off unexpectedly low. Bobby climbed strongly past Allison's high point to win the comp and the $1,500 prize purse. Because Bobby was in isolation, she has no idea that she has surpassed Allison's high point. Her only goal is to try and reach the top of the wall. We've done this so many times before. This is our fifth super final between the two of you. So we've both been the one by ourselves back there and um, just sitting. And usually I have a Walkman, so I just turn it up as loud as I can. And I know Bobby does the same thing. I'd rather not. Same here. I turn that on as so loud. Yeah, it's, it makes me nervous to listen. So. I did. There was one time at the super final we had at Snowbird when I didn't have one. And I was in this little room, and I had my fingers in my ears, and I had the door shut, and I could still hear everything. I knew she flashed it. So I was like, okay, you know, what are you going to do with that? Well, okay, just got to tell yourself, now you know it can be done. I like the social aspect of it, seeing all my friends. And I also like, it's, it's black and white. You know, either you do it or you don't. And I really like what it takes to put the mental and the physical together to just do the best that, that you can do. Jason falls off on the very last hold.
Dale comes off lower than Jason and for the moment holds second place. Hans turns out the performance of the day. He climbs without hesitation to the top of the wall in first place. Sticking the final hold that Jason slipped from, Hans takes home the first place prize of $1,500. Jason comes in second, and Dale takes third. What's the perfect state of mind for you guys to be in? when you start the route, what's the perfect competition state of mind? Having fun. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone I agree? more fun. <laughs> yeah. Usually I don't take anything. <laughs> it just kind of happens. I mean, if you're nervous or uptight, it just, it just hoses you. The more you just, the more it's just like climbing at the crag, the better off you are. Peter Croft is known for climbing in a style that many people consider the purest form of rock climbing. Although Peter enjoys all types of climbing, he spends most of his time free soloing, meaning he climbs without a rope, relying purely on his judgment and concentration. For me, climbing is a pretty broad thing. True climbing is solo climbing, and it's wall climbing, and it's sport climbing, and alpine climbing, and hiking up in the mountains. I think it really is a whole combination of them. And for me, that's what a good climbing year is. Today, Peter is soloing the rostrum in Yosemite Valley. The 900-foot formation is one of the steepest long crack climbs in the valley. The rating is 511C. If I want to push my limits with a rope on, I'm probably going to push myself really close to the point of falling and maybe fall off a bunch. And when I'm soloing, yeah, I might push myself to my limits of soloing, but what, what that means is I get up to a certain point and I go, okay, can I make this solid? And I might, I might be in one place for like five minutes, 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, just trying to figure out some way I can make it so it's totally solid. And sometimes it means avoiding a loose hold and doing a harder sequence to get by a certain section or doing a harder section of jamming instead of doing some face climbing, which feels really insecure. And then if that doesn't work, if I can't make it feel solid, um, then I'll just down climb. So in that way, yeah, I, sometimes I do push my limits in soloing, you know, on routes that I haven't done before and stuff. The first 400 feet of the route is 510. Peter says he likes to use those pitches as a warm-up for the upper pitches, which are more technically demanding. Sometimes he will traverse out from the side of the canyon and downclimb the first four pitches as a warm-up before turning around and climbing nine more pitches back to the top of the route.
Peter is beginning the crux pitch. At this point, he is about 400 feet up the wall. The crack will only accept his fingertips up to the first joint and is too thin for secure foot placements. He must edge his feet on tiny nubbins and crystals on the cliff face or smear the lip of the crack with his toes. Now I feel like I've got everything pretty much under control, but I do know that if I was to lift up that one finger there, I'd fall a thousand feet. That's all it would take. Peter, this is the crux of the route in terms of security. The moves out the roof are bald and slippery. He must pull hard with his hands while pressing in opposition with his feet. The rock is slick and polished. Actually, the day before I first sold the rostrum, I was up in Tuolumne, I was trying to sell this 5.9 called Crescent Arch. I got up to the crux, which is this undercling, which just lousy smears for your feet. I tried a few times, down climbed back down to the ground. I was, you know, maybe 100 feet from the top and 300 feet up or whatever. Anyway, and I just down climbed. It was no big deal. And the next day I sold the rostrum and it felt great. So, you know, the grades are pretty different there, but when I'm soloing, I pay a lot more attention to how I'm feeling rather than the grade. I mean, when you climb with a rope and the protection's good, yeah, you pay more attention to the grade because, you know, you can push yourself to the point of falling. This is the final pitch of 511 on the route. The jams are relatively secure, but the pitch is long and strenuous, coming after 800 feet of sustained climbing. I soloed the Rossum a lot and, and climbed on it a lot, doing harder pitches. It's some of the best of Yosemite. You know, it's long, um, steep sustained cracks, but the position, you know, it's beautiful. You're right above the river and it's really steep. You know, it's, it's steeper than a lot of the other crack climbs in the valley. Um, it's got a really good atmosphere to it. Plus, it's, um, it's in the shade a lot. So you can go there on a hot day and just, and even though it's, it's one of the best climbs of its length and grade in the valley, you don't really get a lot of other people there. I mean, some people wouldn't really get much in the way of re rewards out of it. They would just go, I'm not gonna get anything out of it. Soloing is stupid. So for them, it is. It's not like soloing is stupid, but for them, soloing is stupid. They shouldn't do it. So it sort of depends if you get incredible rewards from it. I think I do. And if I didn't, if it was just sort of a mild buzz and it was the same sort of thing as just going sport climbing, I wouldn't do it because there is a lot of risks.
The sport of rock climbing is fueled by the imaginations and individual passions of those who climb. The exact reason one chooses to free solo a long climb, pursue a series of gymnastic moves, or try a first ascent of an unclimbed peak probably lies beyond the descriptive ability of words. There is, however, one significant component that links together all those who climb. It is something heartfelt, an intimate interaction with oneself at a definitive point, where the necessity of self-reliance resides purely in a single moment. It awakens the most powerful of guiding forces in ourselves, and although it can't be defined in specific terms, it is what drives the human spirit forward. <laughs>